Hey there, neighbors and naysayers. It's Clint Finney again for another Eastern Ohio Grazing Council virtual pasture walk in the winter, March the 25th, 2021. This week, we went up and visited with Mr. Pete Conkle to look over his stockpile and forage, but also to look over some of the other groups of cattle he's got there and how he manages them through the winter. And on special assignment, we've got Pete to tell us in his own words about his own operation. So let's get started. But first, uh, I know I did a tribute to Cliff Miller last time, but uh, I, I did want to mention that this topic or these topics are, are really for Cliff. Cliff always loved stockpile topics. Anything with winter grazing, stockpiled forage, he was passionate about grazing his livestock through the winter. And, and this week, I was digging through pictures, trying to make get some pictures for these, this slide set. And every time I go through a set of pictures, at some point, there's a picture of Cliff or Cliff and his wife standing kind of off away from the group and Cliff just taking it all in. And I can just see looking to ask that next question. Uh, to learn better what, what we've got going on out in the field. Cliff's a big reason why we decided to tackle these winter feeding topics um, because he knew, as we all should, that managed grazing is about improving the production per acre and thus income per acre. And the best way to do that is to reduce our winter feeding costs. Um, there, there's just no better way in eastern Ohio than to grow and graze stockpiled forages to reduce our overall costs, increase our production per acre, and, and thus increase our income. So this one's for Cliff. We're gonna go on and talk about stockpiled forage. Hello, I'm Pete Conkle. I'd like to welcome everyone to our farm and the March 2021 Eastern Ohio Grazing Council Virtual Pasture Walk. I'm gonna share with you how we go about stockpiling some forages in some of our pastures in order to meet the winter feed needs for our mature cows. This group that we're grazing this winter consists of cows ranging in age from four to 15 years old. There's 31 of them here that will calve beginning in April. And we just feel that a little bit easier to graze these older cows because their nutrient needs aren't quite as high as like our bred heifers or coming three year olds. The process that we took in order to get us to this point was we did make hay June 8th of 2020 in order to get some of the excess forage off. And then we did graze this early September with our replacement heifers. And then about September 15th, we did spread a combination of urea and ammonium sulfate in order to begin the stockpiling process. And the reason that we did wait until September 15th to spread that, we were extremely dry July and August, and we were hoping to get some moisture and stimulate a little bit of regrowth before we put that nitrogen down. This group's getting moved uh, every 24 hours and receiving about four tenths of an acre a day in order to graze and meet their nutrient requirements. As you can see here, this photo represents the transition in what's been grazed for 24 hours and what's about to be grazed for the next 24. On the right where the cattle are bedded down, they've been in that cell for just about 24 hours and on the left is what they're getting ready to go into. As you can see, my subdivision fence is half inch poly tape on pigtail posts. I do like the poly tape because of the visibility I feel the cattle can pick it up a little bit easier, but also the deer and other wildlife. Deer seem to avoid it when um, they come up to it, and uh, that helps without with any wrecks. And then I like the pigtail posts. I can carry 10 or 12 of those, set my fence as I'm going across there, and be done and uh, not having to wrestle posts around. Pete mentioned that he started stockpiling his field around September 15th which is really late uh, for stockpile. We typically want to start stockpiling forage somewhere around July 15th, August 1st, August 15th to really get the tonnage that we're looking for. Uh, but because of drought, and I understand that, I was dealing with the same conditions at my farm, uh, it had to be late. And, and so we've got lots of quality here. We just may not have the quantity that we're looking for. And that's okay. We can't always start stockpiling on the date that we wish to. Because of rotations through pastures, 
Uh, a lot of times we start some fields July 15th and some fields August 15th and some even into September. So that's fine. Pete's got some really good quality stockpile here that has kept the cows fed through the winter. And that is what matters most. This picture is showing how I am able to manage the fence throughout the farm. I've got uh, several cutouts in different gate openings in order to cut power to different sections of fence and be able to work on it without having to go clear back to the barn, turn things off, um, and then turn them back on. What we've also done is buried a power cable underneath through a conduit, but it is buried uh, to take the other side of the gate opening. And then I built a lot of um, interior gates using double handled rope gates. Uh, I like that because I can transition cattle from one pasture to another, no matter what side they're on and uh, doesn't limit me by the which way the gate might open or which way the gate might swing. Here's a little video of me going to the perimeter, picking up that reel, and all that is is an electric cord winder with my half inch poly tape on it hooked on to four strand perimeter fence. And that four strand perimeter fence is between myself and another neighbor and uh, only one of those wires is hot. And as I'm coming across winding up that fence, I'm picking up my pigtail posts and uh, letting the cows into that next break of grass. And as I mentioned previous, that break is gonna consist of about four tenths of an acre and they'll be on that for 24 hours. As I get closer to the subdivision fence, you'll see that the subdivision is actually just one strand of high tensile I'm able to shut that off at one of the cutout switches and then work my way to it. You can tell the cows are pretty content. They didn't try and rush the fence or run over top of me or anything. The blonde cow coming there, she was up getting a drink and kind of a late comer there, but decided to join the herd. Because there's uh, only one water for these fields, we do not set up any back fence. So these cows will be able to travel back up to the automatic water, um, which you'll see in just a bit. This is the water for this field. Um, it's just a two ball frost free water. It appears to be an energy free water. Uh, has a heat well probably underneath. It helps keep the water thawed and also um, animals drinking from it and, and recharging that water is what really keeps that uh, from freezing in the wintertime when we get below freezing, of course. Neither of the balls are, are up at this point and that may cause some concern for some of you, but the cows have just been there and drank and sometimes it takes some recharge time for the water to, to fill back in and for those balls to float back up. But, or Pete just may have the ball set down low uh, so that they, they aren't always up and, and visible at the top of the trough. Either way, the cows had water. One word of caution I'll give you with these ball type waters is that you got to pay close attention to instructions when you put them in because there's a certain way or certain level that that water needs to be. And, and, and it's kind of counterintuitive to me. I always figured the ball needed to be up nice and tight and snug to keep it from freezing. When in all actuality, our waters work better when the ball is down just a little bit, when there's about a half inch of space around the outside. And the good thing about that is with at home with our sheep herd, um, I found that the sheep will drink from these ball waters too if we leave that gap. If we made the ball up tight in that hole, the sheep wouldn't drink from it. But if we left the crack, it kept it from freezing and also allowed sheep, baby calves, goats to drink from those, those ball style waters. I threw this photo in here from an earlier pasture walk at Pete's, and I don't know that this is particularly the field that we were in, but just so you all realize that there is a uh, water line that runs down that high tensile one strand fence above ground. And so in the summer months, he can, he can and does put a back fence up uh, behind the cows and uses a portable trough with a job float that is fed off of that water line that's on top of the ground. It's just in the winter months that will freeze. And so he doesn't put a back fence in that allows the cows to go back to water to that frost free trough we just talked about.
In this video, Pete's getting ready to set up the next day's move, the next day's wire. So he takes the gate handle and wraps it around the cold hot wire, and he starts at the that step-in post that's right there. He's already pre-measured the entire field, so he knows exactly where the poly, poly tape needs to go. And he he and I and, and most of the grazers set up their fences a day ahead of time, uh, just because if the cows would get out, there's a fence to stop them. But also, when we go to move, it's a whole lot easier to open the fence, let the cows through onto a fence that's already built. And it is to go up there and build a fence while they're all waiting down below at the, the last day's pasture. They get a little impatient. It's just a whole lot easier to build the fence ahead of time. We could even build a week's worth of fences ahead of time. We know exactly how much forage we need to give them with every move. Here, I've strung out the next day's allotment of fence and then hook the reel onto the perimeter and I'm just setting my pigtails as I work my way back to the subdivision fence. This farm was in row crops until 2010. That's when we decided to go ahead and put it into grass. We also built perimeter fence at that time. I then laid out subdivision fence essentially on the contours and at a width of 210 feet from the perimeter fence. The reason I chose 210 feet was 210 by 210 is essentially an acre. So now I've got my one measurement already set. And then depending on how many acres or half acres I want to give the cows in a day, I, I've got one measurement set. So then I just have to step off that other measurement or wheel it off ahead of time. This helps uh, speed up the fence setting process. Just makes things a little bit easier when I'm out there moving fence. Pete kind of commented while we were there, don't take a picture of my high-tech mineral feeder, but I thought it was a, a good thing to look at and kind of talk about for just a second. It doesn't take a fancy mineral feeder to, to feed mineral to our livestock. Uh, this is just a tire with a Rubbermaid tub in the center of it and an eyelet uh, out through the tread so they could be hooked to with an ATV or UTV or tractor and moved. Um, but we, we really need to think and talk more about mineral feeders and mineral supplementation out there with our grazing livestock. This is for loose mineral. Loose mineral is, is much preferred over the hard salt box. Um, they can get as much salt and mineral as they need and want uh, versus a salt block that a lot of times they would have to spend a lot of time there to get the salt that they would need. So a uh, good thing to talk about. We need to be looking at mineral feeders out there with our livestock and using some sort of loose mineral to supply and meet their mineral and salt needs. As we we're walking around and looking at the quality of the stockpile, um, Kevin asked Pete, have you done a forage sample on this particular pasture? And Pete kind of jokingly pointed down at the manure piles and said, right there, I took a forage sample, look at the manure. And, and he's right, uh, it was, that was well played and well said on Pete's uh, behalf because we can kind of tell by the manure patties, the quality of the manure, uh, what kind of quality forage those cows are eating. I mean, we can also look at their body conditioning and, and their left side to see that they're full and they're getting enough and there's lots of other indicators. And, and sure, uh, this is kind of a tongue in cheek thing. Sure, we could take a forage sample and we would know uh, better and closer to whether they're meeting the cow's needs or not. Although we can really kind of as use a grazer's eye and, and look at the forage, what they're consuming, uh, what they're leaving behind and also the manure pies that they're leaving behind to give us a good indication of what the quality of the forage really is. Two of my goals with the farm is to graze as many days throughout the year as possible and feed as little hay as necessary. In order to accomplish this I have an ideal cow type in mind and that cow needs to be easy fleshing, moderate framed, highly maternal and moderate in milk production. And the way we're, we're able to make these females that we can put back into the cow herd is through our artificial insemination program. We do this by seeking out Red Angus breeders with those same grazing philosophies. And then at the end of June, we'll begin watching cows for natural heats to breed. Then we do synchronize and breed any of the remaining cows. Then after that, we do turn in a terminal sire. Lately, we've been using a Charlet bull to maximize heterosis and then produce a calf that's very acceptable for the feeder calf market. 
as we take a look here at the aftermath of grazing, uh, you can see some openness in the sward there. And that's not to say that it's overgrazed. It's not uh, probably grazed perfectly as good as you want to graze stockpile. But the sward is open enough that this would be a perfect candidate for frost seeding. Uh, now we have to make sure that our pH is correct. Uh, our soil test levels are correct. But this would be the perfect kind of situation to do a frost seeding on a field following grazing stockpile grass. Although I try and graze throughout the winter as much as possible. Sometimes like this winter, we got uh, quite a bit of snow and then ice on top of that and the cows weren't willing to push through that. That's where a bale unroller comes in very handy. Um, that's what this picture depicts is our unroller sitting here on our concrete pad. Uh, we were able to go out, unroll hay for that group of 31 cows and keep them spread out and keep our manure distribution fairly consistent. Um, I know it's not ideal, but uh, sometimes Mother Nature throws us a curveball and we're not always able to get out there and uh, move fence or make them push through that snow. So, um, you know, a piece of equipment like this comes in pretty handy uh, when it's time to feed hay in that manner. And we get this question a lot. When we talk to farmers about grazing stockpiled forage or extending their grazing season, they say, what do you do if it snows? And, and Pete perfectly outlined what they do when it snows or we get ice or some situation where we can't graze stockpiled grass. We simply roll over and feed hay the way we would normally do it, the way we're currently doing it. Uh, it's not that hard. It's not that big a change. It's just you have to change over from grazing to actually feeding hay or some other stored forage when the weather uh, uh, makes it so that we can't graze stockpiled grasses. This is a picture of our pen pack facility that we put up in 2016. We're still working through some management curves on this as to you know when we need to stack manure, when we need to compost, but for the most part this building has been invaluable. Um, I felt that it was necessary to put this up to feed a lot of our young stock in. Um, instead of marketing our calves in say October, November when a lot of other cow calf guys do, I like to hold our calves over and sell them after that January 1st date. That lets us put these, those calves in the barn, not subject them to the harsher environmental conditions and make the best use of the feed that we've got while capturing that manure. This is a picture from inside that pen pack facility. We've got three different pens set up in there and we're feeding wrapped hay in Steinway and J&L type bale feeders. One group, as you can see here, is our, actually our bred heifers. We like to keep them inside and uh, keep them out of that weather just because they're still growing while they've got that uh, calf growing inside of them. So we're just uh, giving them a little bit easier time of it. And then we do have another pen set up for the calves from the previous year that we're backgrounding and then we'll sell as close to yearlings. And we've got a third pen set up where we actually are feeding a few cattle out for a little bit of a freezer beef deal. Um, one thing that I do that maybe um, would other farmers or uh, cattle guys ought to think about is we actually sublease some wheat ground or wheat stubble after it comes off from the neighbors. And what we do is we go in and plant sorghum Sudan in there and um, let it grow until September, October mow it and then we actually have that custom baled and wrapped for us it provides a high quality feed at a reasonable price and uh, it does provide a lot of forage in a short amount of time for us so it's just something to think about you know if you happen to be short on hay or have a neighbor that's got some wheat ground um, doesn't hurt to ask and see if you can't rent that to, to make yourself some better forage obviously this picture isn't from the day we were there. Uh, this is from a picture that Pete submitted for our calendar several years back, but I wanted to include it just to show 
that our livestock will choose to dig through the snow to eat stockpile forage. Uh, there's lots of folks that graze stockpile grass and, and say that they go out and take a bale out to the cows uh, when it's deep snow or when there's snow on the ground. Uh, and what they find is the cows will lay on the hay and go out and dig through the snow to get to the stockpiled forage. And we've talked about if it's too deep or ice or whatever, but we just wanted to show that the livestock will graze through the snow. And we wanted to get the peats while there was still snow on the ground, but it just so happened there was too much snow on the ground at the time we could get there. So we had to pick and choose and take our days and it just so happened it was a day when there wasn't any snow on the ground. So here it is, mid-March, and peats still grazing stockpiled forages. And that's one of the, the hits that stockpiled grass has taken over time is, well, that's great, but it won't last the entire winter. Well, folks, March to me is getting close to the entire winter and he's still got quality and still got quantity out there to graze. And that's what makes stockpile grass um, so interesting and so important to grazing operations here in Eastern Ohio. There is just simply no better way to feed grazing livestock through the winter and by using stockpile grasses, and we could even include winter annuals in there. Um, we've shown before that the, the quality of the stockpiled forage is typically going to be on par and sometimes better than stored forage, than hay or anything else. Um, we, we've also shown time and time again where even if we had to reduce our herd size in order to have enough ground to stockpile forage and graze through a portion of the winter, we're going to be money ahead. We can reduce our cow herd or reduce our flock size and, and allow stockpiled grass to grow and, and actually come out ahead, come out with more income for the year uh, because we've saved money on hay, on stored forages. So uh, I guess with that, I, I'm going to urge us all to, to look into it, to, to get there, to work toward stockpiling forage or growing winter annuals to graze our livestock through the winter. There's just no system that works out better. I mean, as we struggle with winter feeding systems and, and how to feed livestock in the winter, uh, this is the best system for us to be able to graze or to be able to get grazing livestock through the winter. And we have to be planning this ahead of time. I, I tell our grazing folks, we have to start thinking about extending the grazing season pretty much when the grazing season starts. We need to be stockpiling forage just come August 1. So we have to have a plan in place to get started. But I, I'd urge you all to, to get started. This is a great way to feed livestock through the winter. And it just solves so many of our winter feeding problems. As we took this video, um, Pete mentioned to us, there is just no better stress relieving sound than the sound of cows grazing forage. Whether it's stockpiled grass or green growing grass, there is just no better stress relieving sound to those of us that graze livestock than that the livestock happily and contentedly grazing on forage. So listen close, you can hear it, and before long we'll all be hearing it because the grazing season is going to be here very soon. Well, that's a wrap for this week's Pasture Walk. We do want to thank Mr. Pete Conkle for not only allowing us to come up and take photos and video and talk with us about his operation, but for volunteering to have us come up and, and take video and photos of his stockpiled forage. We do appreciate it. And, and I really appreciate the fact that Pete was willing to voice over some of the slides and, and videos and put it in his own words. I know you all probably get tired of listening to my golden voice talk about slides and about other operations. So it was nice to have someone talk about things in their own words. Um, at this point, I, I would like to talk just a second. Uh, we're at a transition period kind of with our forages. If we're out on stockpiled grass, we've got kind of new grass kind of poking up through and we've got to be very careful this time of year not to overgraze those new, new green growing shoots. In a perfect world, we would have a field that had a ton of stockpiled grass in it that we could put our livestock on so that we can ensure they didn't get into that green growing grass as much. But we don't always live in a perfect world. Some of us have stockpile that just isn't that, that big and just isn't that tall. And we gotta realize that our livestock are gonna get into those green growing shoots. And we're gonna have to allow those fields some time to rest and recover here in the spring once we've moved our livestock on to, to new pasture. And also, I know a lot of you are starting to itch to turn livestock out. I've been getting some calls in here and questions about it. 
Uh, I think it's still a little early. I think that we need to have at least four inches of forage before we turn livestock out on pasture. Although I think that number kind of floats. I think each operation kind of has to have a number or a, a size difference where they can can feel comfortable about turning livestock out on pasture. Some folks say four, some say six, some say eight. Uh, I think at, over time we have to develop uh, how much forage we really need when we turn out in the spring and, and stick with that number uh, to ensure that one, we have enough forage out there to feed our livestock, but two, there's enough forage out there to allow for a rotation and for the forage to have had enough time to rest and regrow before we return back on those first pastures we turned out. So we'll have some more presentations coming out here, hopefully in April, uh, hoping to go and look at some more stockpile of grass. Uh, and we'll probably do another presentation of some sort toward the end of April. And then we're hoping to resume in person live pasture walks for the month of May. So with that, I'll say we'll see you next time.